Welcome everyone to our 52nd BizHack Live, our weekly look at digital marketing and small business best practices. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the founder and CEO of BizHack Academy and the host of BizHack Live. And we're so honored to have you guys here. Uh, and we're very honored to have the amazing Dave Bricker, uh, a uh, BizHack alumnus and professional speaking coach and storyteller uh, here today to talk about 52 Speaking Blunders, his brand new uh, presentation and website. It's, a, it's honestly a brilliant way of teaching what to do by teaching what not to do. It's a heck of a lot more fun to see other people's mistakes. I'm really looking forward to today's presentation. I haven't seen it yet, Dave, but I know you're going to crush it. Um, I wanted to specifically call out uh, South Florida Integrated Marketing Association for promoting today's event. Uh, they're one of our uh, many sponsors, but uh, we, we so appreciate all the work that the Safima has done. Uh, we actually have Safima's founder, Cheryl Cattell here, uh, who is our BizHack Live speaker yesterday, did a beautiful job uh, talking about LinkedIn. Um, and so thank you to Safima for all that you've done for marketers in South Florida. Uh, and for being a sponsor and partner uh, of our award-winning BizHack Live webinar series. I really want to encourage you guys to ask questions. Um, the way that you can best do that is through the chat. Um, this is going to be uh, kind of an interactive um, e exercise, so just throw your questions in the chat. Uh, you'll see right now the chat has a comment in it. Uh, also, feel free to say hi, share your LinkedIn, um, and uh, definitely uh, interact with us. It's great to know that somebody's on the other end of the line. I wanted to quickly mention uh, the BizHack lead building system. This is really the, the pillar of everything that BizHack does. Um, and we have a, coming up, we have a seven week program to work with small businesses on implementing the lead building system into their marketing. It's a, it's a simplified, but not, oversimplified approach to small business marketing. The foundation is business storytelling and uh, Dave Bricker is gonna be touching on that. The, we then have the six pillars and the nine steps and a seven week program that walks you through how to do it. Um, if you want a sneak peek of how that system works, uh, join us tomorrow at 2 p.m. Our lead instructor, Alex Oliveira and I will be doing a business storytelling workshop and we'll really give you a sneak peek into one of the lessons in the seven week program. Would love for you guys to be there. Uh, keep an eye out in the, in the uh, chat for a registration link for that. And if you're interested in joining our upcoming course, um, please do uh, hit the, uh, go to our apply now page and apply for it. It starts on July 12th. So Dave Bricker um, is uh, an extraordinary uh, writer and storyteller, and um, I'm going to read to you what he shared with me. Uh, by the time he graduated college, Dave Bricker was living aboard his own tiny sailboat. He set sail for the Bahamas with a locker full of food and dreams and $40 in his pocket. His voyages took him to the Bahamas, Chesapeake Bay, and across the Atlantic to Gibraltar. He returned to the land of clocks and calendars with what he's, he'd gone in search of, stories of his own. So today as a speaker uh, and presentation coach, Dave helps remarkable people tell remarkable stories. That includes all of you on today's session. If you wanna say it, share it or sell it, bring Dave your story, he'll help you tell it. Uh, without further ado, Dave Bricker, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dan. And before I begin, please take the underwear off the doorknob and turn on your cameras. We're gonna have an interactive uh, presentation today and the more audience I can get the more value I can give to you so do your best and it's appreciated and if you're just not dressed yet okay I get it but uh, let's see if we can get some some faces on the screen because it really helps so moving forward let's talk about presentation skills and I'm just curious give me some thumbs up or some uh, gestures or something in the chat how many of you think of yourselves as professional speakers? Do we have any professional speakers in the room? I see Dan. I'm not seeing many hands up. Of course, I'm seeing a lot of black screens, couple thumbs up. Okay, good. So 
let me run something by you here. Do we have any teachers in the room? If you're a teacher, okay, you're a professional speaker. You speak more for a living than most people who are professional keynoters do. I'm a recovering academic. I used to teach four hour classes. Guess what? You're a professional speaker. Any attorneys, any lawyers in the room? Never spoken in a courtroom? Never spoken to a client? Come on, let's get some hands up here. Salespeople, anyone in sales? Try to do sales without speaking. Good luck with that. These are such important skills. Anyone in customer service? Again, that's an important speaking role. It's all about relating to people. And sometimes it's even more of a sales position than the traditional sales people because you have to really sell people on the idea that maybe things weren't as bad as they thought they were. And almost everybody is a professional speaker. Don't think about Tony Robbins. And yet, we don't get training in this essential skills, the, the art of eloquence, the art of influence. If we start thinking of ourselves as professional speakers, how much of our livelihood depends on our ability to communicate with other people using our voices and our bodies, then presentation skills become absolutely critical. And most people are terrified of public speaking, even though they make their living with it. Why should we focus on presentation skills? How many lost business opportunities? How many people have lost your business because they gave you a boring data dump presentation that you couldn't wait for it to be over? And you said, thanks for your presentation. That was wonderful. We'll think about it. Bye. Nobody's interested in your offering if you don't know how to make it interesting. Such an important sales skill. Unproductive meetings. How many people have been to those death by PowerPoint meetings that go on and on? Or you're at the meeting and you think, why are we having a meeting? Why didn't they just send me an email? What a waste of time. I see people clapping for that one. Unproductive meetings cost America $37 billion a year. Now think of the value of presentation skills to you and your organization. And then this is what I call the pig bitch. We need to turn that into the big pitch because otherwise it's the same problem. It's another boring meeting where we waste our time and energy and we don't build the relationships that lead to the outcomes that we're trying to produce. And then finally, if there is one powerful way to get that confidence to go for it, it's to develop your skills as a speaker, as a presenter, to get that experience in front of an audience could be one person. That could be a person you're asking for a raise. It could be a person you're asking for a date. We're so afraid to make that presentation. And yet these are the kinds of things that can be life changing. Now I could give a whole course in presentation skills, but we have a short time today. And I want to just talk about a few of the common blunders. I've got a list of 52 of them, but I'm going to throw a few of them at you today. And I'm going to try to get some volunteers. I can't read the names from this distance because I'm standing, which is another speaking tip I don't really cover. But look at all this room I've got to walk around the stage and actually engage you. You can see my hands move instead of this talking head thing. I could come up right up close and it's not the same thing. That's cost of entry. So giving myself a little room, but let's move ahead. How are you going to engage those audiences? That's really the key, isn't it? How are you going to give a dynamic presentation? And we'll talk about what that word dynamic means. It sounds like a synonym for good, but dynamics are so important in terms of the way we communicate. We want to offer better evaluations. Now, most of us aren't spending all our time evaluating speeches, but if you're trying to learn music, you listen to other musicians and you think about, wow, what did they do that I loved? What did they do that didn't work? And when we understand a little bit about speaking and the art of engagement, then we can start listening to speakers, whether they're comedians or teachers or salespeople or keynoters, and we can start thinking about the things that we want to adopt and the things that we want to reject. And if you're in, into organizations like Toastmasters, these are the strategies that will help you win 
contest, and you may or may not be aware of it, but there actually is a world championship of public speaking. And it's a pretty exciting contest. Over 30,000 people start and one person finishes every year. And the person who gets that trophy, they've got their career made as coach if they want it. And of course, look what we've all been through. I'm not gonna dwell on the whole COVID thing, but we've all had to adapt to Zoom. A year and a half ago, we would have been sitting in a room having this meeting, and yet here we are, and many of us have gotten comfortable. Now we're going to have to adapt to hybrid meetings. How can we speak to an audience that's on the screen and also an audience that's in the room and keep everybody engaged? So now there's a whole new set of skills coming around the corner that we all need to learn if we're going to get good at this. And getting good means transforming minds, hearts, and fortunes, the people we are speaking to. And of course, we want to bring home the business. This is biz hack. This is a business group. So financial success, reaching our goals, all important aspects. So I'd love to get, if I could, a volunteer from the audience for a little exercise. You're We're not going to be calling on somebody out. I can help you calling somebody out. Who would you like? Would you like me to help you with that? That would be great because I can't read the names, but hopefully someone will have their hands up. And I know people like, oh, I don't know. I'm the first one and it's public speaking and I'm scared, but we're going to have fun with this and I'm not going to put you on the spot or embarrass I, you. I'm, I'm looking at who is trying to not meet my eyes. Right now, Stephanie is kind of looking away. Uh, <laughs> so uh, why don't we start with Stephanie? And I also see Richard is volunteered. So why don't we start with Stephanie? Uh, and she's unmuted. <laughs> Welcome. All right. So Lilia, can you spotlight me and Stephanie? Perfect. Gettysburg Address. Oh, here we go. Excellent. Hi, Stephanie. How are you? It's always good to see you. Hi, Dave. Happy to be here. <laughs> okay. Very good. Okay. So let's take a look at this wonderful piece of Americana. Can you just give that a, a, a cold read for me? Yes. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Pretty wonderful. I wish I'd written that. The whole speech is, I think, 264 words, and it's so full of, of great ideas. There's, there's, I, I did a whole workshop on that speech once, but let's not go there. So one of the things that Winston Churchill did, especially after he showed up with incomplete notes and couldn't remember the very last line of his speech, and, and he finished, and this is in the House of Commons and Winston Churchill's, and it all rests with, hmm, and it all rests with, and he could not remember who the matter rested with. People thought he'd had a stroke. And from then on, he said, never trust your memory without your manuscript. However, let's take this same thing, Stephanie, and let's break it into what Winston Churchill called psalm form. I'm going to take this, and I'm just going to break it into individual lines. Now, you'll notice there are no, there are, the lengths differ, but what happens is now I've broken it into individual thoughts. Give me another read, but where you're now thinking, instead of reading a paragraph of text, you're reading... You're reading these thoughts, these ideas. Okay. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Thank you. Did anybody hear a difference just from that? I see Dan nodding. Yeah, just breaking. So when you write a speech, or even if you're going to read a speech, get out of paragraph mode. We're not reading novels here. If you really want to bore yourself, go, go to the writers, you know, whatever, the, the writers club, the writers association, and go to open mic night and listen to people read out of their books. Some of them are great books, but, but it's, remember Charlie Brown? Wah, 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 wah. I mean, it's just terrible. All right, now let's add a little bit of emphasis. And what I've done, if you look closely, is I've underlined 
a few of the words. Now you might choose, there's no right and wrong way to do this, but you might choose to underline some different words. But for now, give this a try, or at least use this as a clue. Okay. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Anyone starting to feel it maybe in the heart a little bit more than in the head? It's pretty cool. Why don't you give it one more try and, and, and punch up that emphasis just a little bit more. And you'll notice that I've got the three dots, ellipses after, sir, after the lines. So yeah. you can add a little bit of pause there. Give us a moment to reflect on what those mean. Hey, Dave, I, I think what she needs is she needs to change the words and say that all people are created equal. And I think she'll nail it. I think that's a, I think that's a great point. Uh, Abraham Lincoln wrote it in 1867, mm -hmm. but I think, I think whether it's mankind or people kind or women or men and women, you won't get any um, pushback from me other than that. Here's the way the man wrote it. But I think we should certainly expand the meaning. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll just go as is. Thank you for your uh, suggestion. Four score and seven years ago. Our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Thank you. And all women too. Can we get a hand for Stephanie? <laughs> and more importantly, did we hear the difference just by writing it out and emphasizing a few words? If you've got no more time to do anything than that, just writing your speech out in that format and taking a highlighter or underlining certain words will give you huge insights into how to deliver it. So thank you, Stephanie. And then Dan or Lilia, can I, can we kick Stephanie off? Thank you. We love you. <laughs> Thank you. It was an honor. <laughs> and and, and can, we get, can we get another volunteer? Yeah, we have Richard Nantel. Thank Thanks, you, Richard. Richard. Can you and add you can... a spotlight for Richard? Yep, and he's unmuted. Hi, Richard. Hi, Hi everyone. Hi. How are you? Welcome. Hi, Richard. Hi. Very good. Okay, let's talk a little bit about pauses and timing. I'm going to give you a line. And it's kind of a humorous line. You might throw that in a speech somewhere, but give that a dry read. The hardest thing to live with is regret, or maybe a teenager. Okay, it's fun. Now what's gonna be, we're gonna work on this line a little bit. Now everybody knows what the line is, but by the time you finish it, everybody's gonna laugh even though they already know the joke. So let's look at the power of the pause here. First of all, let's add some emphasis words. Let's take this first part of it. The two most important words in the line are what? Hardest and regret. Okay, and that's my opinion. You might choose different words. There's no rules here, just guidelines. So what does hardest sound like? And if you have ideas about that, throw some words in the chat. Not you, Richard, you can focus on the screen, but just as so everybody can join in. What does hardest sound like? Is it long and soft? It's got some struggle in it, right? Maybe a little anger in it. And what does regret sound like? Do we say regret? So think about those two words the hardest thing to live with is regret. Um, someone and, you're in, in a CI system that, that actually probably can help you. I think we've got someone who needs to mutate their microphone. Or, or. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. So, Richard, give, give a try here and see if you can punch up those two words and make us feel 
feel those two opposite emotions. Okay. The hardest thing to live with is regret. Okay. Amplify that a little bit more. I want to hear your, your life struggle in hardest. Be a little bit more theatrical. Get a little out of your comfort zone. And then regret. I just want, I want you to feel like you just lost a loved one. The hardest thing to live with is regret. Beautiful. Did you see what he did too? That little pause? That's emotion. That's starting to come from the heart. Now, one thing that speakers and musicians do this too, they, they're afraid to stretch the time. They're afraid the time's going to break. So what I'd like you to do with heart after live with, I'd like you to take a deep breath and I'd like you to give us an uncomfortably long pause there. Like you're really stuck in that emotional space. If you want, look down, shake your head, take a deep breath, and then come back with that this regret. You know, like you can hardly get it out. Try that, okay? You're doing great. The hardest thing to live with is regret. Good. Now I want you to double that pause. I want you to make it really like you think you're just getting, like everybody's going to pull up a browser window on top of us and start checking their email because we can't tell. So make that hardest really punchy, the hardest thing to live with, and then, you know, go do your taxes and come back. All right? <laughs> okay. Try it. The hardest thing to live with is regret. Beautiful. Everyone feeling that? Now we read the line and it was just a line. Now the words are becoming meaningful. Now there's this little gag line at the end. So maybe you're in that sad moment and then it's like, or maybe a teenager, like come back, pull a switcheroo on us, take us out of that sad moment and give us that little joke at the end. Like, like, oh, or of course this, duh, right? So now you're going to be a little sarcastic and you're going to switch gears on us. The hardest thing to live with is regret. Or a teenager. Yeah, beautiful. Richard, how did that feel? Really good. Yeah, it's, em it's empowering. How did it feel to everyone in audience land? I see a few thumbs up. I'll take what I can get. Richard, thank you very much. I think you did a fantastic job and hopefully you had a little bit of fun doing it because I think this stuff is a lot of fun to do. Thank you. All right. Can I get another volunteer, please? I'm going to volunteer tell somebody. Let me see. Gloria Volun volunteered. Oh, oh, I saw some Gloria volunteered, baby. Love it. Usually around this point in the, in the presentation, people start thinking, hey, wait a second, nobody died. Maybe I'll volunteer. Yeah, I, I have a little hesitation in the beginning and then people start jumping in. So Gloria, thank you very much. Can you tell- By the, by the way, just um, for future volunteers, uh, just to make it a little easier on us, if you wanna go to the reactions button and raise your hand, that'll just be kind of a standing volunteer pool and we'll uh, call on you as, 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 as we can. Great. Can I make a suggestion? Because the reaction thing goes away. They can just go into participants and raise their hand, and that stays there. Good. Perfect. Good. Either way. Sounds good. All right. Gloria, can you tilt your camera down just a little bit? Yeah. All right. That's good. <clears throat> so let's play around with a similar exercise, a little stage direction. Now, this is something you might say to somebody who's walks into a party and decides to take it over. <laughs> so what, what's, uh, you've been there. I can see that this is a sadly familiar situation. This is one of those lines I thought of and didn't have the guts to say. So it now lives as an exercise in this presentation. But give this a try and, and channel that attitude. Talk, talk talk. You may be an honored guest, but 
You are not the guest of honor. Okay, good. There's a lot of stuff that you naturally did, but I want you to speed it up just a little bit like you're actually talking to somebody. Okay. All right. I, I actually really admire your restraint. Very rarely do we have to tell people to speed up. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. Just be, get, give somebody some sass now. Okay. Talk, talk, talk. You may be an honored guest, but you're not the guest of honor. Okay. So somebody's getting to talking to here. I like it. Now I've added some emphasis words, right? Yes. And talk. some of this you're doing naturally. Well, it, I talk, I talk, talk. So that's all right. We all, we all talk, talk, right? None of us knows what's going to come out of our mouth five <laughs> seconds from now. It's amazing how we improvise all day and then we get on a platform and we don't, we're terrified, but <laughs> try, try a little of that. Just guidelines. Talk, talk, talk. You may be an honored guest, but you're not the guest of honor. All right. Someone feel like they're getting, a, getting an attitude adjustment here? So sometimes what I like to do when I'm creating a speech is write in a few stage directions. Now, the first one you did naturally, lower your pitch, talk, 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 right? Because it's like you're admonishing someone and treating them like the child they're acting like. But now we might use our hand and say, point at somebody. You may be the guest of honor. Then we'll look at someone else. But you are not. I mean, you may be an honored guest, but you are not the guest of honor. Give, give me that mama finger there. <laughs> talk, 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 talk. You may be an honored guest, but you are not. I mean, you are not. <laughs> the guest of honor. All right. So if you add a few stage directions, you can start choreographing these mm -hmm. things, right? You may be an honored guest, but you are not the guest of honor. Now imagine this is, you're coming into these things cold. Imagine if you were preparing for a speech and you had a chance to rehearse some of these things and really find the way that fit you best. How would you feel when you walked out on the platform to actually give your speech? Oh, really confident. You feel good. You're like, it's getting ready to be on. The curtain is going up and the show right? is on. Because you're not thinking about, am I going to remember the words? Even if you got the words 80% right, what you're really delivering is that attitude. Yes. And the audience is paying attention. And it feels good to do that. Because if you're like me, you don't have the guts to say that to someone unless they've really got it coming for too long. But now you're on stage and it's, it's theater and you can do it. You can do it as outrageously as you want. There's not going to be any repercussions. But imagine the alternative. Talk, talk, talk. You may be the guest of honor, but I mean, you may be an honored guest, but you're not the guest of honor. Ho-hum. Everybody's checking their email. <laughs> so what a difference it makes. Gloria, you're marvelous. You're natural. Thank you so much for jumping in on the exercise. Can we get a hand for Gloria? Good job. All right. So I don't see, oh, I see um, any hands up for, do you need another volunteer? Yes, please. All right. Uh, so guys, put your hands up if you're interested in being a volunteer. Back to you, Dave. I'll let you know when we have one. All right. Have Joni Lloyd. Um... Is that correct, Joni? That's the she was answer. just clapping, but let's let's call her on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, go ahead, back to you, Dave. This is one of my favorite exercises. This is a really fun one. Do I? Can we spotlight the who, whomever it is is going to be joining me? Yeah, if you can turn your video on, because if not, I cannot spotlight you. So yeah, let's uh, let's pick Susan Windmiller, please. Hi, Susan. Nice to have you here. Uh, so we'll use Susan on this one. Um, All right. If you, if you want to be volunteer told, you got to have your video on. Yeah, please. But but and, but thank you for stepping up anyway. It's it's appreciated. I don't want the contributions to go un, unrecognized. <laughs> so Susan, thank thank you. 
one of the things that, that I've noticed when I coach speakers is a lot of us tend to hold back. And I've even seen people and you ask and get loud and they go, oh, I am getting loud. They choke it back. And I think what happens to us is when we're children, we're screeching around on the playground. And I think this happens to the girls before it happens to the guys. And somebody steps in and says, use your inside voice, act civilized, grow up. <laughs> and we spend the rest of our lives restraining ourselves and, and, and trying to accomplish this, this goal that I guess it makes sense if you're in an elevator or, or, or trying not to annoy the people next to you at the restaurant. But what I love about this is it's not about being more theatrical. It's about what I call rediscover your big because there's a gigantic big spirit inside each of us, which is just dying to be let out. And so often we spend our, our time holding it back. So some more lines and stage directions. Let's try this one. Can you give me a dry read? Have you ever wanted to speak out, but were afraid to say anything? Okay, so what are the two actions, the two opposing to speak out and to be afraid. Right, excellent. We don't even think about these things. So what if we were to do it a little bit more like this? Have you ever wanted to speak out but were afraid to say anything? I'm hearing the contrast. So now what I'd like you to do, there's a, there's a pause after speak out and I wanna hear speak out like you've, this is the first time in your life you've been allowed to speak out and God damn it, you're gonna go for it. And your next door neighbors are gonna hear you and call the police. So <laughs> go ahead and give me a nice, nice loud speak out and then let it hang and then come back into that afraid place. See if you can give me that big contrast. Remember I spoke about dynamics. This is what I mean by dynamic presentation because your audience is afraid to do this. And when they see you do it, they're gonna go, wow, I felt that, that was amazing. So I know this is probably a little outside the comfort zone, but hopefully not so far outside. Give it, give it a try. Have you ever wanted to speak out, but you were afraid to say anything? How'd that feel? Great. Yeah, it <laughs> does it. feel great. Now, I'd like, I, the impact of the words is not actually in the words themselves. It's in the echo of the words. So after you say, speak out, I want you to hold that. Count in your head, like count to five or six or eight. Stretch that time till you think it's going to break. And then come in and be that meek and meager and afraid person. So we've got that big angry outburst followed by that. And, and, and let's see if we can hit everybody in the heart with it. I think you're darn close. Have you ever wanted to speak out? But we're afraid to say anything. Oh man, this is my exercise. I'm feeling it. How's everybody doing with this? Marvelous. <laughs> it does feel good to do this. It's such a powerful exercise. But when we think about go be, going beyond the words and the other thing that you did naturally is you didn't say, did you ever want to speak out? Mm -hmm. But we're, I mean, you, what do you do? You went into that re reflective, sad place. You know, have you ever wanted to speak out? <sighs> but we're afraid. You see what I mean? It's like, and you did that very naturally. Like, what am I going to do with that space? And you kept performing in that space. I didn't direct you to do that, but somewhere you said, I got to do something and I've got to, I've got to act out how that feels. And all of a sudden you're there. So Susan, that was marvelous. Can we get a big hand for Susan? Thank you. And thank you for stepping up. It's one you're of my favorites. Thank you. I love doing this, but it absolutely transforms people personally and professionally. It's my favorite thing in the whole world to do. All right. 
Now, this is a section I call dialogue or dialogue because a lot of people really mess up dialogue. So I got a couple of fun exercises while we still have a little bit of time. And Dan, can you find me another volunteer? Dan, you're mutated. Mark Teetbull. I hope I, I probably massacred your name, Mark. Uh, you're on mute, by the way. How did, I do on, how did I do on your last name, Mark? Close. Close. What, how do you pronounce it? T-Bowl. T-Bowl. All right. So, Mark, thank you for stepping up. Let's play with a little, a little piece. Just give it a read. If you want, read it to yourself first and then give us a dry read. Okay. I looked around and saw nothing. Where am I? I'm lost at sea. And then Strider's voice came back to me like he was there with his hand on my shoulder. Trust your compass. Okay. Now think about, there are actually three characters in this dialogue. Okay. <laughs> There's a narrator. And then there is the person who's actually back having the experience, right? And then there's Strider at the end saying, trust your compass. So think about, we tend to think I'm giving the speech, there's just me, right? But take that first line. Now, another thing we can do is I looked around and saw nothing. And a lot of people might do something like, let's, let's say it's, you know, I looked around and saw nothing. Okay. But when we do the action and the words at the same time, we're, we're using different parts of our brain at the same time. So what if we did something like this? What if you started off with, I looked around and saw nothing, right? So do the action first. And then now you're sitting down. So what you, are you in a swivel chair? Perfect. So what I'd like you to do, since we don't have a stage to work with, is figure out what side when you go into the story, then when we go to where am I, I'm lost at sea, swivel your chair. Don't look at the audience now because you're not that, you know, look, look off to the side and like, where am I? I I'm a, let's hear that fear. So try that first, those first two parts. One is I looked around and saw nothing. And then the other one is being at, instead of telling what happened, I looked around as past tense, right? Now you're, where am I? Now we're moving into present tense. So take the, the viewer, the audience right into that scene. Try those first two lines. Okay. I looked around and saw nothing. Where am I? I'm lost at sea. Okay, good. I want, when, when you say you saw nothing, I want that to sound a little desolate and desperate. Okay. And then just quick turn. You don't have to do a big, you know, but just maybe figure out right or left because Strider is going to be the other side when you get back to that. We're going to okay. go from narrator to you in the scene, back to narrator, and then to Strider. Okay. Okay. There's some little bit of choreography here. So figure out which, it's all right. What's the, what's going to happen here if you don't get it right the first time? Who cares? We're right. all here to fail forward and have fun. And we're not going to polish these things today, but we'll think about them. So I looked around and saw nothing, right? Make us, make us feel that nothingness. Okay. Then, then just, I keep using my stage, right? I'm moving, but just a little bit. Wh wh where am I? I I'm lost at sea. And then you can step, get ready for the, the next narration. Okay. I looked around and saw nothing. Where am I? I'm lost at sea. And back to the center. And now continue. And then Strider's voice came back to me. Yes. And then Strider's voice came back to me. I can't actually read it because you're in front of it. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. That's all right. And then Strider's voice came back to me. 
like he was there with his hand on my shoulder. Trust your compass. Yeah. Do you want to change your, he's your Yoda, right? So mm -hmm. maybe he says, trust your compass. He's, he's that big mentor. base wise mentor voice, right? He's okay. the teacher in the story. Okay. And you I could can say, with his, like he was there with his hand on my shoulder. Okay. Pause. Now I go to this side, right? Trust your compass. And then we get that shiver out of it. Okay. It's tricky because we don't even think about a piece like this in terms of narrator, old me, character, right? I mean, there's a lot, there's, there's a, a crazy love triangle going on in this simple piece. Okay. And then the first part, when you say, I looked around, you know, do this and then stop with the gesture and say, I looked around. So you're not doing the gesture and the words at the same time. I'm just throwing more variables at you. So this becomes even more complex. You do it great. <laughs> All right. I looked around and saw nothing. Where am I? I'm lost at sea. And then Strider's voice came back to me like he was right there with his hand on my shoulder. Trust your compass. Yeah, everybody feeling it? How did it feel to you? Good. Yeah, kind of fun. You know, Matt, imagine, imagine you had a week and said, rehearse that, work on that, <laughs> right? I mean, we're doing all this stuff on the spot. So I think it's fantastic. I think you're doing great. Mark, thank you so much. I'm going to move on. And, and I think I've got time. I want to leave a little time for Q&A at the end. So I'm going to actually skip my next dialogue piece. Hang on. All right, let's move on to time travel. This is a fun one. Can I get another volunteer? All right, any volunteers? This is uh, Carl Gittens, hey buddy. All right, Carl. I was getting ready to pick on Dan. I was thinking, man, it's getting rough. I'm, I mean, I did uh, 10 years of public speaking as a radio journalist, so I'm not a good, a good, uh, Anyway, I've been trained in all this. Carl, how are you? Fine, sir. How are you? Carl, thank you for, for joining in. So what I'd like to talk about now, again, I've got the luxury of a bit of a stage here. I've got a nine-foot area behind me, but usually we're presenting in a space. Are you in a swivel chair? No, but I can, I can move side to you side. You can move around, even if you I'm, can I'm lean still a little bit. <laughs> now, remember that if I want to talk about something moving through time or space, I'm going to start on my right and move toward the left because my right is your left. Right. So remember that when we, whenever we do something lineal like that in front of an audience, we need to turn it around. As a matter of fact, I just coached a TED speaker and she was talking about swipe right and swipe, le swipe left and rejecting opportunities and embracing the new. She was talking about her dating app as a metaphor. We really had to think about which, which way do we want to swipe for the audience to understand which direction she's swiping. So you'll have to turn that around. And so we're like, operating with your right or my right? Your right is the viewer's left. Okay. Just as if you were facing me in a real room, right? Right. This is my right hand. It's on the left side of your screen. Got it. Okay. So as what? Well, so when you move in progression, big hint, hint, hint here, then you want to think about positioning yourself. This kind of a Jedi mind trick, but you can take people across stage. So here's the here's the line. Simple line. Go ahead and give it a dry read. Prehistoric men drew on cave walls with a burnt, burnt, stick. a burnt stick. Today we create with a keyword and misuse. And a mouse. And a mouse, sorry. Uh, what what tools will we use to express yourself 10 years from now? So what's the journey of this piece? From the past to the future. From the past to the future. So when you read the first line, you might start on the right side of the stage. And then when you read the second line, the present tense, today we create, 
and then move to the move to your left, which is the audience's right. And they might not even notice you doing it, but I've seen speakers and they're talking about, oh, we were, we were losing money like crazy. There was just no profit in what we were doing. And then we met the most amazing coach. And a year later, we were just, you know, and people don't even understand that they're being led the, where your position is. So if you can tilt your camera down a little bit so we can see a little bit more of you. Very good. And if you need to, I know you're not on stage, try the line and just read it a little bit. And if you're having trouble seeing it, would you like me to read it out loud one more time? No, I have it. Okay, good. Prehistoric men drew on cave walls with a blunt stick. Continue, okay. Today we create a key, we create with a keyboard and mouse. What tools will you use to express yourself 10 years from now? Okay, so now do the same thing, but walk us across the st start, start on your right, <laughs> sliding around. I know okay. if, you, if you need to, if yeah. it's uncomfortable, start in the middle, but then just turn and start on your right and just do this kind of thing. So right. let me come up close to simulate that. So maybe I'm just gonna be like looking over here right. and moving to here and moving to here. And if I can lean a little bit, it's much easier to do standing up, but you get the idea. Take us physically on the journey. Prehistoric and men. Drew start on, start on your ball. right. Start on my right. Start on, on, my your, on your right. Yeah, there you go. Prehistoric men drew on cave walls with a burnt stick. Today, we create a keyboard and a mouse what tools will we use to express yourself 10 years from now? Okay. So I want you to do it one more time, but I want you to emphasize the word prehistoric today and 10 years from now. Wow. So that we're, you're physically anchoring it now. Now give us those emphasis words and it'll click, I think. You're really close. Prehistoric men drew on cave walls with a burnt stick. Today... We create with a keyboard and a mouse. What tools will you use to express yourself 10 years from now? Very good. How does it feel? Good. Like maybe if you, if you had a week to, to really polish it, you could do all sorts of things with it, right? Exactly. We're just experimenting and exploring for the first time. So that's, that's great. I know that we are closing in 10 minutes. I'm going to skip another exercise because I want to leave questions. Just quick review here. All of these little bits of theater that we've been working on and, and uh, thank you again so much. Can we get a hand for everybody who stepped up and got in the hot seat today? I appreciate it. Think of these little bits of theater as the towers in your suspension bridge. The stuff in between is just connecting tissue. And if for every major point in your speech, You've got something that you're doing with your voice and or your body, your dynamics. All of a sudden, the speech memorizes itself. Towers and spans. I call this the suspension bridge method. And of course, nobody's seen a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge lately. I have one. Anyway, what can we do in summary to make your speech pop? We talked about psalm form, vocal emphasis, pauses, ha uh ha. -huh. Stage directions, dialogue, stagecraft. And we didn't cover sound effects today, but we did talk about the suspension bridge method. If you want more of this material, I've got a whole online course. It's a short lesson, three to five minutes in your inbox video lesson every week at 52speakingblunders.com. And I am available uh, through the site or through my personal website at, uh, for coaching and workshops at storysailing.com. I didn't put the link there, but I'm sure Dan can put it in the chat. And with that uh, commercial done with, I am going to open up to comments and, and any questions you might have, provided they're not too tough. Perfect. Uh, guys, it's an intimate group, so feel free to just unmute yourself and ask a question if you have one. Um, I'll kick us off, which is, 
Um, would you mind telling us a little bit about your um, Toastmasters and, and how you've used that to help you build up your skills? Well, I can coach people all day, but I can't give you an audience. And what's marvelous about Toastmasters, I've been in that program almost four years. And through that program, I have observed over 700 short speeches. Not all of them have been very good, but the worst ones have taught me more than the best ones sometimes. There's a club near you. There's a great club that I happen to be part of that meets on Wednesdays at seven o'clock. There's another one, uh, the Brickle Toastmasters that meets at 1215 on Fridays. But if you go to toastmasters.org, you can find uh, Toastmasters clubs all over the place. They're all virtual, but getting ready to go back. And I know a number of the clubs are really getting ready to embrace hybrid meetings and tackle all of the challenges of doing that too. Toastmasters is, I think, 360,000 people around the world. I know Stephanie's here. I met her through Toastmasters. Uh, Toastmasters sponsored so the World Championship of Public Speaking. And it's your speaker gym. It doesn't matter how good you get. Why would you try out new material on a paying audience? Whether it's a sales pitch, whatever it is that you're doing. I've got a musician in our group who is working on the material. He speaks between songs. And you get feedback from supportive people. Toastmasters is fantastic. Yeah, Thank it's, you, it's really important uh, if you want to improve your public speaking skills to, to just do it. You know, uh, when people rank their fears, they rank public speaking ahead of death. Uh, it is probably the most universally feared uh, thing. And you just need to get a lot of repetition of getting in front of people and overcoming that in order to make it through. Yeah. Uh, we have a question. Yeah, can I address Audrey's question about what about people who freeze? Guess what? You're normal. People are terrified of public speaking. And again, I'll go, I'll defer to Toastmasters for that one because I can coach you all day and you're still going to be terrified when you first get in front of that audience. But what happens is I, I've seen people who are so shy, pathologically shy. You know, the people who meet you and they stare at your feet and give you the limp noodle handshake because they don't want to make eye contact. I've seen people like that come into the Toastmasters Club, get comfortable and realize that nobody's going to tear them up, that even if they get feedback, it's going to be loving and kind and supportive feedback. And it's like learning to play an instrument. You practice, you get better, you work on it, you get some coaching, you find a good teacher. But I've seen people who are just, I thought they were just, they, they needed to be institutionalized. They were so shy. And two or three months later, they're up there in front of the room waving their hands. It's like, what, what happened to that person? And So Amy Williams has a question. All right. Hi, Dave. Thank you so much. What tips would you recommend when a person is in the middle of their presentation, they stumble on their words or they misspeak, what recovery process do you recommend? Do they acknowledge their stumbling? Well, you know, it's interesting today, not the same problem, but today at 1227, my internet cut out and reset. Now, in that case, I didn't come in and apologize or anything like that. I didn't make a big deal. And, and so far, I have no nasty notes in the chat about it. It's like, okay, I came, came back two minutes late at 1232 or whatever. And in the meantime, I had my hotspot set up and I was ready to figure it out. So, okay, if you can just go for it, just go for it. But in general, um, love means never having to say you're sorry. So if you forgot your lines, just... To say, hey, <laughs> give me a second, brain freeze. All right, I'm still working on it. And they'll laugh at you because you know what? The audience, for as badly as you might screw up there, the audience is, they're rooting for you. And as long as you, I mean, it can be really stressful. So just, if you just find yourself in an unrecoverable fumble, like, okay. I'm an idiot. I'm going to go get my script. Ah, oh, there it is. Picking it back up. And you know what? People will just applaud you for owning the mistake. It's like any other business mistake that you make. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to embarrass yourself along the way. Just own it. A friend of mine literally fell off the stage and she got <laughs> up. She, 
pretty, she could have hurt herself. She got up and said, I will now take questions from the floor. And she got a standing ovation. So audiences really do want you to succeed. And it's an opportunity to be vulnerable because, okay, you made a mistake. You forgot your line. Winston Churchill forgot his line in front of the House of Commons. Your stakes are probably not going to be that high. So what can you say? You know, I we had this experience yesterday where Cheryl Cattell was um, doing a presentation and she came in a few minutes late. And um, honestly, you just, you know, she was there when she needed to be. And we um, we just kind of blasted through it. It's as if it hadn't happened. And um, the one big thing I've learned from years of doing this uh, as a public speaker is what you project is what your audience reflects or mirrors back to you. So if you are feeling nervous, they will feel nervous. If you're confident, they will feel good in watching you. And so just fake it. You, you just got to project confidence, project belief, project, um, you know, poise. And then, you know, you pull your shit together afterwards. Uh, but, but as long as you project, you know, like when I was in, in, at NPR and I was doing um, national broadcasts about stories that I had literally read an article about in the Wall Street Journal 10 minutes earlier and then would have to go on national air and sound like an authority. I always said, look, I know 1% more than my audience and I'm going to use that 1% and I'm going to just milk it and sound like I am an expert in this topic. Any teacher so, knows that you got to be one page ahead of the class. You can teach anything. That's all but, it takes. You but, know, one page. We have a, um, Dan and I have a mutual friend, Bruce Turkell, who's, who's a, hall, a Hall of Fame speaker. And he's been a, a friend and a mentor to me. And one of the things he told me early on, he said, Dave, it's not a question of if you're going to bomb, but when. Sooner or later, it's just going to be the wrong topic for the wrong audience. And it's going to be a bunch of sleepers in the room. He said, rite of passage, not the end of the world. Sooner or later, you're going to be presenting with slides and the projector bulb is going to blow. Well, guess what? All of these things have happened to me. I admit it. I've bombed. I tried to figure out why. I have some ideas. I learned from it. But okay, sooner or later, if I keep doing this, it's going to happen again. It's a rite of passage. It's part of the journey. You can't please everybody all the time. Just do the best you can every time and you get better and better at it. So Susan Windmiller, this will be our last question, asked, do you memorize your speeches? How do you keep notes to be sure you don't forget something and not keep eye contact with your audience at the same time? Okay, a couple of things. If it's a throwaway speech, like something I'm going to give once, well, you can't see in the room I'm in. I'm standing in front of a green screen and across the room, about five feet away from me is my camera. And on top of that camera, I've got a little monitor about the size of an iPad and I can run my teleprompter. And once I build all the pauses and things into the teleprompter, I can read very comfortably and very naturally and even underline certain words and color some of the text. That's one way. I've also given presentations that were longer, but where I didn't have, uh, you know, sometimes they use like today, I've given this presentation many times, but I've got the slides that just keep me on the rails. I know the loose order of the slides. They're 90% memorized, but as I keep clicking the button, it reminds me of what to talk about. It's my secret outline. And then of course, um, you know, I've actually been in a long presentation, no slides, and I'll just tape a little outline to the floor, not the full text, but just this topic, this story, this story, this example, da, 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 da. And I've got a little outline. I'll tape it to the floor of the stage. And once in a while, I'll look down and just keep my, okay, nobody really notices. And nobody even cares if I've got notes because most people are sitting there standing behind a lectern reading, which is really boring. So if you're going to, I mean, use whatever you need. It was Churchill who said, never trust your memory without your manuscript. Great advice. You know, um, my tactic is that I would write it out all longhand or type it up. And then I would bullet, I would practice it. And then I would bullet point it into like a little piece of paper and then just have the bullet points as a reminder. And, you know, you just look down at the bullet points and then you move on. It's really, if you're not embarrassed about holding a little cheat sheet, they're, they're not going to care or notice. And, you know, even some of the best 
stand-up comedians will have like a little list that kind of reminds them of their act and sometimes they'll take a look at it. And as long as they're cool with it, it's fine. You know, Lilia talked about how with dancing, the only people who knows the choreography are the dancers. And so if you make a mistake, really it's only you and the dan other dancers who even know. Same with public speaking, you have a script and if you go off script, the only person who really knows that is you. So I actually find going off script, as long as you don't go too far off, uh, is the fun part of public speaking. It's what makes each speech feel unique and different and you can respond to the specifics of the audience that you're with. Um, Dave, before you go, uh, you have 52 speaking blunders. Which one is your favorite blunder? My favorite blunder and probably the most powerful is the purpose of the speech is to transform the audience. If you don't go into the presentation understanding exactly how you want them to think, feel, and act different, then you're all set up to give a boring data dump speech. If you're talking about prices, processes, ingredients, and data, you've missed the point. You are up there speaking to transform people. Understand what you want to give to them. Write the ending of the speech first. Everything else leads up to that. And once you really know that you're giving value to your audience, you can turn nervous into service and the rest just comes together. Great question, Dan. Thank you. Dave, uh, I really appreciate you. Um, you've been such a, a loyal uh, fan of, of BizHack. And um, any, anything you wanted to say really quick before we uh, wrap up just about your BizHack experience? My BizHack experience was very positive. I learned a great deal about social media. I highly recommend the course, especially as things keep evolving and developing and uh, that was just, I've met Dan before the course, but uh, stayed, stayed connected for several years now, I guess. And yeah, yeah, here we are. Positive experience. I'm Absolutely. You're part of our community. And, you know, one other quick note I'll make about um, is improvisation. I did improvisational comedy as a way to obliterate my fears about public speaking. And it was really, really helpful. There's nothing like going in stage without a script uh, to make it uh, less scary when you have one. I feel like I'm always cheating when I go in front of these audiences with, you know, slides ready to present. So uh, we'll wrap up now. We have training grants for those of you who might be interested in uh, and work at companies of 10 or more. Just wanted to let you know about that. Uh, if you're interested in digital marketing, uh, we do have some training grants that uh, come from the federal government, workforce training. Tomorrow at 2 p.m., we have our business storytelling workshop with the amazing Alex Oliveira, our lead instructor. He runs an agency that's generated more than 22 million leads. This is our signature storytelling workshop and kind of a sneak peek of one of the lessons, uh, the, one of the key lessons in our seven-week program, which starts July 12th. We'd love for you guys to join us for that. Um, next week on BizHack Live, uh, we have how to find a work-life balance from a female entrepreneur BizHack is very intentional about serving women entrepreneurs. Uh, we More than 70% of the people who take our course are women. Um, and we wanted to create a topic specifically about some of the challenges, especially during COVID, uh, of being a woman entrepreneur. A lot of women have dropped out of the workforce as a result uh, of COVID. It's actually set us back more than a decade in terms of work equality. Uh, the week after that, on, July, on June 9th, we're going to be talking about two ways to leverage LinkedIn to build rapport and generate new business. Uh, this is a sales navigator technique and I highly recommend you attend that. Uh, after that, we're gonna be talking about finding customers through Google with Jeff Cooper. Jeff is the SEO firm uh, head uh, we, that we use here at BizHack and comes with my highest recommendation. And then we're gonna be talking about a uh, somewhat wonky but really important topic which is Google Analytics for beginners and advanced with Ben Holland and then three Fortune 500 marketing techniques that small businesses can use with Jessica from Track Data. And that's another one that's sponsored by Safima. Really appreciate you guys. Um, if you want to support uh, this BizHack Live, keep it free as a service that we provide now that, that we've uh, had more than 50 of these over the last year. Uh, you can buy a season pass. This will sign you up for all of the sessions that we have coming up. And you'll also automatically get a follow-up email with uh, the link and the presentation and the recording from, the, from that presentation. So 
I uh, hope you join us for BizHack Live this time next Wednesday. Thank you again, Dave, and all of you guys for coming today. Really appreciate you. Thanks, Dan, and thanks, everybody. I had a good time and hope you did, too.